settled forever that God loves me and always will. Okay? Now this is a little trick here. It is settled forever in my mind that God loves me and always will. What is the difference between those two statements? In one word, what's the difference? Mind. <laughs> I would say the difference is faith. Because one of those is, a, is more or less an established, well it is an established fact, but it's not necessarily always established in my mind, and so it's faith that makes that happen. Now on the second one, it is really just way too easy to say true, isn't it? Because we have been taught the doctrinal truth of God's love for a long time, and we wouldn't dare say that that one was false. However, it is when we are in the fire that our true beliefs come out. Now, everything in this world system, as headed by the devil, would, would try to convince us that God, if he even exists, is not on our side. That's what Satan wants you to believe. That's what the world tries to convince you of. And it is... Well, it goes right along with what our own sinful nature tells us. And so there's three things right there that are very powerful to try to get us to disbelieve in it. Thankfully, God's love is more powerful than the world or the devil or our sinful nature. And so it is possible for us to come into a place where in our minds, consistently, we truly believe that God's love for us is infinite. You know, sometimes I wonder if maybe one of the reasons why God leaves us on the earth for the whole rest of our lives is because it takes that long to convince us of His unending love for us. I always just used to wish, why didn't God just zap us and take us to heaven? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the big ones, perhaps the main reason, is so that we can be convinced of His love and that our faith can grow when we become into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, I want to think for just a minute as to why this is important. Believing and understanding the depth of God's love for you is absolutely foundational to everything in your life. Everything. It is the ultimate source of your ability to operate in this world as a Christian. For example, in order to be able to love like we should, we have to be able to understand and know His love for us. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because He first loved us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of Christ controls us. So, so when Paul prayed for the churches that he had helped, that he started, probably the thing that he prayed for most often was that they would know and understand the depth of the love of Christ. So that's why we, as a church, spend so much time on this subject of understanding and believing in His love. And that's why we spend a lot of time talking about our position as believers in Christ, our position as His children. Trust me, you want to get this. And I bet I don't have to convince. We are not even aware of all the ways that we doubt His love. Because those are hidden doubts often, and we are not even, you know, we don't, we're not even thinking about it a lot of the times. But when trials come, then our doubts have a tendency to come to the surface. Uh, maybe with some of us, it's not so much an actual doubt as it is just a question: Are you still there? Do you, are you, do you still love me? Uh, are you in this? So thank God for trials. That gives us a chance to unlearn some of the things that we need to, right? And so that is one of the undercurrents that is continually going on actually in both of the letters that Peter wrote, but particularly in this first one. Never let your current circumstances make you doubt God's infinite love for you. Let me say that again. Never let your current circumstances make you doubt God's infinite love for you. When interpreting Scripture, one of the first things that we do is to look at who's writing 
Who is he writing to, the original readers, and what did it mean to them? That's actually an important part of understanding what it means to us. And you can read a scripture and you can get some thoughts out of it, uh, but we also want to try to interpret scripture as it was meant to be done. And so that's one of the things we look at. So let's start off by taking a look at who these people were. Uh, we started in this book last week, and I know I read these verses already. Steph, would you pass me one? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we'll read them again this week for the sake of review. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, now all of these areas are what is now in Turkey. Uh, you can see the, the area of the map there. There's a Basically, that's not intended to, that red square is not 100% accurate, but that's the area that today is Turkey, and pretty much all of these areas that he wrote to are in that area. Now, you notice that he addresses those who are scattered. The Greek word for scattered is diaspora, which is a sort of technical term that can relate to the Jews primarily. See, one of the consequences of the rebellion of the Jews, as was predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy, is that they would be scattered away from their homeland all over the earth. And this started, really, in the 8th century B.C. with the fall of the northern kingdom. And it waxed and waned, and, and of course Judah was carried off. They got restored, about over, almost 50,000 of them returned from captivity to rebuild uh, the city walls and the temple. But it continued to wax and wane until the year 70 A.D. And in that time, the, uh, the armies, they're called the Roman armies, but they were really Syrians, for, for that matter, as far as their, their true nationality goes. And as you know, they have and always will hate the Jews. And so uh, they are the ones who actually destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city. It was completely burned. And all of the Jews that did not get killed in that massacre fled Jerusalem and they scattered. Now, a lot of them went north and northwest, and so thus we have a lot of Jews who are scattered around through this. Now, some of you may be wondering, why, why would we be interested in a letter written to Jews? Well, because Peter was not just writing to Jews. Remember that uh, in, the, in the very early years after Jesus' resurrection, all of the Christians were Jews. It was only a few years later that God revealed that salvation was going to be available to Gentiles also. So, so when the Jews were scattered, the Christians were also scattered. And we know that Peter is writing to the scattered saints, and that's what he calls them. He doesn't actually say he's only writing to Jews. Uh, but he says these scattered saints, and we know that he's writing to Christians who are in these areas of the world. That was not a, a God-fearing part of the world. A lot of idolatry. Uh, there were, for that matter, a lot of Jews in that area that were very antagonistic to Christians. And so they had a pretty rough time of living in, the, in that area and anywhere else, basically, that they went. Now, why do you suppose that Peter started off a letter to scattered saints that emphasized God's love? Again, obvious, right? If you were uprooted from your home and you had to move to another country because of persecution, forced to flee to a strange place, a strange culture, forced to find a new job in an area where you were very insecure. It would likely be a job of very menial labor because of your unfamiliar with the language and the culture and your lack of having any roots. You're feeling lost and lonely. Don't you think you would need to be encouraged and reminded of God's love? That is where this letter starts. Now, though we have not experienced it all like they did, we have had enough of a taste 
of it to see where this letter is coming from and where it is going. And it's going to be important as we, as a nation, as we experience more persecution that will arise and more antagonism for, towards Christianity, uh, that we have some things down pat as far as our belief system. So let's start off with this statement. Because being an alien is hard, we often need reassurance. Last week I spoke specifically about the fact that we are resident aliens of this world. Now before I go on though, I just want to make sure that, that we're all kind of on the same page. Because I don't mean to imply by this that we are going to feel not at home all the time and in every circumstance that we are in. I mean, that's really not your experience, is it? Do you feel not at home all the time? No, we, none of us feel that way. I mean, you know where I feel most at home at? Home. <laughs> I really like my home. It's not, a, it's not a very big house and not, not, not necessarily all that fancy, but you know, I really like it. And I bet it's the same way with you guys. Regardless of, uh, of, of how fancy or big it is, I bet you really like your homes and, and we enjoy that. And because we live in a suburban uh, type town, then we all treasure having our own homes and we can go there. And, and if you want to, you can, if you have a garage with an automatic garage door open, you can drive from home to work and you can open your garage door and drive in and shut it and never have to have any contact with any neighbors or anybody else around you, right? And, and that's kind of a suburban value. It's, it's not that way in the big cities, especially in the inner, inner cities. So, you know, we, we like our privacy. Uh, we like our, our independence. And we like our security. Uh, you don't always feel at home I mean, excuse me, you don't always feel not at home uh, on the job. You don't always feel not at home. Well, I started to say when you're in Walmart, but yeah, I kind of feel not at home every time I'm in Walmart. Uh, speaking of aliens, uh, I've seen a few in there that I think were aliens. From another planet, I mean. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, basically, I mean, our experience is not constant animosity. You know, when I feel the least at home is when I'm watching or reading the news. And there are other times that I, I really don't feel at home. If I, am, uh, if I am in a restaurant and somebody at the next table is being very belligerent, have you ever, ever had that experience? You're trying to eat a quiet dinner and somebody is, is being belligerent, using really foul language, and, and insulting the waitresses, and yelling at people across the room. You know, I've had that. I, I don't feel at home, <laughs> uh, you know, in those, in those situations. But see, the thing is, as we move forward, we're going to feel less at home than we do now. We're going to be more at odds with our culture than we are now. And so that's one reason why 1 Peter is really, really important to us. Because I don't want to wait until that time to get ready. Alright. We looked at verse 2 last week. There are some wonderful things about being resident aliens in this world. There are some things that go along with that that are great truths. So in verse 2, he says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Let's stop right there. Uh, we looked at the foreknowledge of the Father and choosing us last week. So now we see a little bit more information in that it is by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. It was the Father's will, the Father's choice by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Because we were chosen and called out of the world by God of the Father, we're also set apart. That's what sanctifying means. Set apart from the world by the Holy Spirit. We, the scattered exiles, the resident aliens of the world, are strangers to the world because God called us out. Now, that is actually really good news. Let's just say that you want to paint your car. All right, we're going to talk about the this sanctifying, this is the idea of setting apart. Listen, listen, you're going to paint your car, 
What color are you going to paint it? Well, bright red, of course. <laughs> and you've watched YouTube videos, and so you pretty much know all there is to know. I mean, it can't be that hard, right? Well, I don't know that much about painting a vehicle, but I do know that before you start shooting that red, you've got to tape off and cover up all the stuff on that car that you don't want to be red. So you're going to tape off windows and, and trim and grill and lights and, and anything on this car that you don't want to be red, you're going to cover it up. So what you're actually doing is you're separating out the part of the car that you want to paint from the car that you don't want to paint. Now, that is not a perfect illustration, but it, I think, gives us an idea of the sanctification that God does. You know, through the Holy Spirit, He sets us apart because there are things that God is going to do for His children that He's not going to do for His not children. There are things that we receive as believers through faith that the world does not receive. And so, because of that, the Holy Spirit set us apart. He set us apart. Alright, so what are some of those things? <clears throat> In the rest of verse 2 that we didn't read yet, it says, For he, he set us apart for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So we were set apart to be sprinkled with Jesus' blood. Now that, I think most of you are familiar enough with this word picture that I don't really need to explain how that... You know, that's, I mean, to an unbeliever or a person who's never been in church, that would seem like a strange idea. You know, sprinkling with Jesus, you know, what does he do? Does he dip his finger in? You know, but what we, what we all know, and I think most of us anyway understand, is that this is a symbolism that comes from deep out of Old Testament uh, law and pictures. When they offered sacrifices in the Old Testament, they would take the blood and they would do various things with it, but they usually applied it to something. They would either pour it out at the base of the altar, or they would take it and they would sprinkle it on the four corner horns of the altar. Sometimes they even put it on, uh, like what the priests would be consecrated, they would put it on their, on their foreheads and their thumbs and their toes. And, and so all of this was a, a big amount of symbolism about the blood. And the, the idea is wrapped up in the word atonement. You'll see that word a lot when you read, especially in the book of Leviticus. Atonement. And that word means actually covering. Covering. So imagine that here's your black sinful heart. We don't want God to look at our black sinful heart because we know what He'll see. But the blood of Jesus, as the death of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus is figuratively put over our hearts, covering them so that God sees that instead of the blackness of our hearts. That's what atonement means. But it's actually more than just covering. Atonement also means cleansing. It's covering and cleansing. Now, I just know that you're going to love this illustration. But when the cat <laughs> gets in the litter box and does his business, what does he do? He covers it up, right? But we all know that underneath that litter, the substance has not changed. Right? When we are covered by the blood of Jesus, not only is it covered, but we are also cleansed. We're made new. We're washed clean. The very essence of our heart gets changed Amen. by the salvation that God gives us. Now this is, this is super meaningful to me. One of the reasons is because you know, I have to struggle against sin. I know none of you do, but I have to struggle against sin. Now, I'm joking because every Christian has to struggle against sin. If you're not struggling against sin, then uh, better start praying for God to save you. Uh, every Christian does it. It's very meaningful to me to know that my heart's been cleansed. Uh, it's my flesh that lags behind. 
Then in verse 3, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So in addition to being covered by His blood, we are set apart for the new birth. Now, I think it's important that we learn to acknowledge that we didn't have one single thing to do in bringing about our new birth. I cannot take one ounce of credit. It was 100% God, 0% me. Now you may think, well, wait a minute, I prayed the prayer, I repented and asked Jesus to save me and believed in Him. Yes, that's right, you did. Did you have to? Yes, you did. You wouldn't be saved today without that in some form. But it is not correct to say that that action of ours caused us to be born again. Right. It's God completely and totally that caused us to, to that to happen in us, bringing life to us, awakening us from the dead, and our response to His movement in our life is, of course, that we, uh, we place our faith in Him and we repent. And that's all, you know, and, and it's, you know, some people argue about which comes first. To me, it's all, it all happens so fast that it's, it's kind of like, it just, you know, is a, it is an event. God, bring, God causes me to be born again. I repent, place my faith in Him. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But let's not get hung up on words or fine theological points because if we do, we'll miss the issue here. And that is, as scattered strangers, as resident aliens, you were born again to that. God caused you to be born again, and that's part of the status that you now, yes, I'll say it, enjoy. The Holy Spirit gave birth to us. And I do mean that in spiritual terms, but just because I say spiritual, that doesn't mean unreal. Right. It's just as real as a physical birth. It's just not a physical body like what we're used to seeing. Now, this new birth, as I said, is to an alien status, but it's to a lot more than that. So I want to think about that for just a minute. When a, when a new baby is born into this world, there are already many realities that are already true of that baby. There are things that that baby is actually born to. The parentage and the ancestry of that baby are already set, right? And at the time the baby's born, uh, that child is born to a whole man. Of course, that can change over the course of, of his or her life, uh, but but that's he's born to that. And yes, a baby. I know that this is so confusing, but a baby is born male or female. <laughs> Don't get me started on that subject. And to agree, a baby is born to an inheritance. It may be good or it may be bad, but inherit we will. And I'm not talking about material inheritance only. So. Let's just use that then for our next thing. We were set apart to receive an inheritance. In verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So let's talk about this inheritance. And I'm going to talk of this inheritance more closely looking at the non-material aspect of it than I am the material aspect. But let me make it clear that there are material aspects to the inheritance that we expect as we receive from our spiritual father. In eternity, we are not going to be spirit blobs that just float around in this ethereal world. We are going to have real material bodies that live in a real material world 
that not only has streets paved with gold, but also has rivers and lakes and trees and mountains and, well, nature. I've, I've talked to people before that said, I'm not sure I want to go to heaven if everything's made out of gold. <laughs> that, that's not it at all, folks. There will be a lot of gold there, but there's going to be an awful lot of nature as well. And it's all going to be perfect, and it will never get old, it will never get worn out. Uh, the trees will not succumb to diseases, and neither will us. So, though I'm not spending much time on this material aspect of the inheritance, just know that it really is important to me. I mean, I'm excited about that aspect of eternity. And it's going to never end. We're used to anything good coming to an end, don't we? But it will not. Okay, that said, I want to think more a little bit about the immaterial aspects. And so in order to do that, let's go back to the, the earthly child again. What kinds of things do earthly children inherit from their earthly parents that are not material? I'll give you a few illustrations of this, but I, I do want to tell you in advance that when I give you these illustrations, I'm not trying to distinguish between traits that are actually inherited through genetics and things that are actually learned from the environment. Now, I know those are very, very much different, but I'm just going to kind of lump it all together and say, what do we get from our parents? What do we get from our early life? What do we get from our environment? What do we get even physically through genetics? All of that I'm putting together. So, a child inherits temperament, personality. A child uh, inherits physical tendency like height, eye color, hair color, intelligence, which is, I think, both ways. Ways of dealing with problems. Temper. Beliefs. Sometimes the kids inherit or learn from their parents. They, they get problems that have to be overcome, but other times it's just things that make us who we are. But we're all very, very much affected by our parents and influenced by them. That makes me happy because of who my parents are. I got a jump start on a lot of people. Now, sometimes a child grows up thinking, I am not going to be anything like my father or, or my mother. Some of you may have said something like that before in your past. And so perhaps maybe one or both of your parents were alcoholics and and because of that, you didn't have money to buy pencils and paper for school, and you didn't have uh, anything like food other than macaroni and cheese dinners, and, and you know, you just really had it hard, and, and the addiction of your parents made it really difficult for you to, to survive, and you said, I am not going to be anything like my father or my mother. I will say this, statistically, children of alcoholics are more likely to become alcoholics than others, but sometimes it works the other way. Sometimes we just say, I am not going to be that way. And so maybe in that area, we're not. But the, the thing is, we're concentrating so much on this one area that all this other area, we become just like our parents and we don't even realize it. <laughs> so you're going to get a lot from your parents. You're going to, I'm going to use the word, inherit a lot of ways of thinking, a lot of ways of speaking. Um, you know, I, I learned the expression, I'll live till I die if a tree don't fall on me from my dad. A lot of things I say came out of his mouth. A lot of things I say came out of my older brother's mouth. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> Whose parent do we have as a Christian? God. So in the same way that an earthly child receives and, and comes into a life that is very much shaped by his earthly parents, so also a new Christian comes into a life that is very much shaped by his Heavenly Father. We have an inheritance. Now, it may seem like that you're struggling with that idea because it is as we learn the new that the old has a tendency to fall off. And how many of you wish that you had a lot more old falling off than what you have now? Me? 
All right. We wished we'd have old falling off. Well, it's as we as we come into the new, that's when the old falls off. And so we we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, working in us to make us into the image of Christ, to teach us the way Christ thinks, so that we can start thinking that way. We can start feeling the way He feels. We can see things from His perspective. And most importantly, we believe that what He says is absolute truth. Even when He says something about us. So that is a non-material. And so, what does that mean in eternity? Well, if we're going to talk about the non-material inheritance that I'm going to receive in eternity, you know what? When that day comes, I am never going to sin again. And you know what? I, you know how much I'm looking forward to that? Not only though will I not sin anymore, but I just won't make any more mistakes. And, and I won't say things that I regret later. I'm going to have a character that, although on a smaller scale, is like God's character. And it's going to be wonderful. And I have never, ever felt that good about myself before in all my entire life. But the Bible tells us that when we're in heaven wearing those crowns, there's a tendency to try to take that crown off and throw it at Jesus' feet because we know that He's the one who actually accomplished it. So I won't be proud. I won't be self-satisfied. I, uh, I, I won't be arrogant because I'm going to know that my Jesus did it all. But as far as who I am, there will be nothing about who I am that I'm disappointed in. And I will never get depressed. Amen? Amen. My, my mental state will not go downhill. My emotional state will always be perfect. That is an inheritance that to me is just as strong as streets of gold and, and, and undying nature. I'm really, really looking forward to that. Sparkling in our character like God. Alright, so we've talked about three things that God set us apart. He, he set us apart uh, like He would set apart the parts of your car that you want to paint. He set us apart so that we could be covered or toned in His blood, our hearts made clean, and so that we could experience, <coughs> experience the new birth and we also receive an inheritance. So we need a lot of encouragement because we are strangers in a strange world. Because the Spirit moves us in an opposite direction than the powerful current of the world. I don't know about you, but it is very easy for me to get caught in that current. <clears throat> and it may or may not be necessarily stuff that we would consider to be gross sins. It's just, just world stuff. And it's easy for me to get caught into that because, I mean, we are living in the world, you know, and so we, we have to go to work, we have to go to the store, we have to buy stuff, and, and you know, we, I'm going to, I don't know if we need entertainment or not, but we all want it, we look for it in some form or another, and we need recreation in some form. And so as we get into things, it's kind of easy to just get into something that maybe carries us someplace that we don't really want to go. And it doesn't mean that we avoid entertainment, that we avoid recreation, or avoid anything else. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's easy to slip into the current. Kind of like you're swimming in the ocean, but every once in a while you accidentally get caught in a riptide. So, <clears throat> in that sense, we, we have to be very careful. And we have to remember that this world is not our home, that we are not strangers here, that God does not necessarily want us to feel completely and totally at home in this world. And therefore, all of our focus, all of our attention is put on Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the lover of our soul, so that the peace that He wants to bring us can be full. So, Never ever let circumstances dictate your faith. Never let circumstances cause you to doubt God's infinite love for you. And remember that everything you go through in this life 
will be meaningful in eternity. And I believe every detail, some more than others, that everything you go through in this life will somehow be meaningful in eternity. That changes my focus quite a bit. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for giving us these words of encouragement and for reminding us this morning of our atonement and our new birth and our inheritance and, and that you have good in